Shopping. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and thank you for attending PsychCentral.com's monthly webinar series. A few housekeeping items before we get started. One, we cannot see or hear you, so nothing that you do will interfere with the presentation. If you have questions, you can ask them anytime by typing them in. However, the presenter will not see them until the end when they are moderated by yours truly. So without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to the presenter and get started. Thank you so much for attending, and I'll talk to you in a few. Hi, I'm Christine Hammond. Thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, as we talk about the gifting of borderline personality disorder. And that might sound like a strange title, um, but I really do believe this. And the reason I believe it is because I've known and worked with and even have had family members who all have borderline personality disorder. And the first time I became aware of what it was, I didn't really know what was happening. I was a small child and visiting my grandmother that I didn't see very often. And she would just say some of the strangest things to me that I had never heard before anybody else saying, like, you know, when you leave, you're never coming back and I'm never gonna see you again. And, um, and then, while I was there, when I first would get there, she would be so excited to see me and um, kind of be over the top and be very extravagant. And But then like by the end of it or towards the end of it, she would be angry at me for, um, for something, for not calling her or talking to her earlier or sooner. And I remember it being just super confusing to me. Like, how do we go from this like, like really wonderful time to all of a sudden she's like talking to me as if I'm going to abandon her and never come back again. And it was very, very confusing relationship that I had with my grandmother for many years until I went to school and found out what borderline personality disorder was. And then I realized that that difference that I had been experiencing as a child and that confusion um, actually had a name and it helped me to understand better where she was coming from and what was going on deep inside of her. So uh, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go through some um, objectives and I want to just tell you the three things that we're going to quickly cover. We're going to cover a quick identification of borderline personality disorder so that you know what it looks like when you see it. We're also going to talk about the relational impact of borderline personality disorder, how it, um, how it, how it uh, impacts our relationships. And we're going to talk about some of the strategies for both working and living with borderline personality disorder. And my goal in all of this is to really help get you to the place where you understand um, what borderline personality disorder means and what it means to the people who have it and not treat it as something that needs to be run away from or abandoned or um, treated badly just because they might have this disorder. So the first section we're going to talk about is the identification. And I just kind of want to go over with you um, the DSM-5 definition. So this is a technical definition that we use for borderline personality disorder. And I have a picture up here of Vincent Van Gogh, and I'm going to talk about him in a second and just why I believe that he also had borderline personality disorder. But his, his face, and this is a self-portrait that he did, um, and his expressions um, are very, very fitting um, for what the disorder was. And so here's some signs and symptoms. Um, number one is uh, frantic efforts to avoid being abandoned by both friends and family members. Number two is an unstable personal relationship that alternates between idealization, so I'm so in love or I love being with you, and devaluation, which is I hate them, I hate you. Uh, this is also sometimes known as splitting, so going back and forth between idealization and devaluation. The third is distorted and an unstable sense self-image, which often affects moods and values, opinions, goals, and even relationships. Next is impulsive behaviors. These can have some very dangerous outcomes, such as excessive spending, unsafe sex, substance abuse, or even reckless driving. 
Then there is the suicidal and self-harming behavior, which we'll get into a lot later on. There are periods of intense depressed mood, irritability, or anxiety that lasts for a few hours to a few days. Um, there's chronic feelings of boredom or emptiness. There is inappropriate, intense, or uncontrollable anger, followed by shame and guilt. And then the last is dissociative feelings. And this is really a defining characteristic in my mind of borderline personality disorder. So this is the ability to disconnect from thoughts or sense of identity um, and having this kind of like out of body feeling. Um, sometimes th this can have some paranoid thoughts uh, and some severe cases can actually lead to brief psychotic episodes. So people can have um, some of these symptoms. There's only a requirement for five of these symptoms to be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, or they could have all of the traits. And there could be a varying degree. So you could have like this on a scale of one all the way up to a 10, which would be not just borderline, but borderline and another personality disorder combined. So in the top left corner, you're going to see um, Vincent Van Gogh, and he's what I would call a real-life borderline. And um, what happened with Vincent is that he really felt abandoned when he was sent off to boarding school at a young age. And he actually never began painting until he was 28 years old, so it was quite long in his life. He had this history of very short-term relationships. Um, he was an alcoholic. He was a smoker. He had lots of violent rages. Um, but him and his brother maintained a very close relationship. And uh, although they didn't live in the same city most of their lives, he wrote 600 letters to his brother during his lifetime. Um, Vincent really did not do well financially. His brother managed all of his artwork. Um, and Vincent did have a friendship with Paul uh, Gauguin, who you see in the bottom right hand corner, and we'll talk about him in a second. Um, and that relationship wound up turning sour at some point in time. They lived together as roommates. It turned very sour, and, um, and Paul just decided he was going to leave one time. And so fearing abandonment, Vincent actually attacked Paul with a razor. Um, and then, then Paul went off, and um, Vincent retreated back to his flat where he then cut off his ear with that very razor. He bandaged up his ear and then he delivered the ear to a woman at a brothel. Um, so upon that happening, he was then hospitalized in a mental institute for a while where he painted Starry Night, which is what you see right below him, which is probably his most famous painting that he ever did. The value of this is over a hundred million dollars. Sadly, Vincent committed suicide at 37 years old but he painted 43 self-portraits and 900 paintings. Mind you, that is just in a nine-year time period of his life. So that is quite extravagant and demonstrates a large amount of passion on his part. Um, Paul, on the other hand, who you see in the bottom right corner, um, was probably narcissistic. He was very arrogant and believed that he was just superior to Vincent. Um, and his most famous painting, which is the one right above him, um, actually sold for $300 million. So um, the point of all of this is that one of the other defining ways that you can tell uh, someone who might have borderline personality disorder is by their relationships and by the turmoil that their relationships might actually cause. So let's talk about for a second what's in a name, because borderline is just such an interesting, strange name all by itself. And where in the world did that name come from? Well, in the 1930s, psychoanalyst Adolf Stern first identified this group of people who seemed to be between neurosis and psychosis, and he called them borderline. Well, today, we actually call them more schizotypal. They, we don't really refer to them as borderline because the definitions have changed so much. But since then, unfortunately, um, even though the official definition of borderline has changed, the name stuck with this group of people. Um, but the name is no way a characteristic um, of being of borderline personality disorder. So there's nothing about the disorder that lends itself to the name except just um, history at this point. A really great example um, of, of just kind of the misinterpretation of borderline 
um, personality disorder would be the movie Girl Interrupted. I don't know if you've had a chance to see that. Um, it's definitely well worth watching because it will show you two characters in it um, who both have borderline personality disorder. So let's talk about a couple of additional characteristics. And some of these um, that I'm going to mention are ones that are going to be very apparent the very first time that you meet a borderline. And whether it is a person that you're meeting, if you're a therapist like myself, and you're meeting them in session, or if you are meeting them at work, you, it might take you a little bit longer, several meetings um, on a date. It might take you a little bit, couple of dates before you see these characteristics. But these show up fairly quickly um, early on in a relationship. So most people who have this disorder feel very overwhelmed and worthless, angry, lonely, and the big word here is misunderstood. They really feel like people don't understand where they're coming from. They also have a tendency to have what I call dichotomous thinking, which is, means that they really don't see the gray area between good and bad or black and white. They don't really get to see that at all. Dichotomous just means that it's just very strong opposites. It's one extreme from the other. They tend to have unrelenting crisis, like there's just one crisis after another and it just doesn't ever seem to stop. There's also some form of active passivity where they're not really taking action even though they might know what the right thing is to do. One of the really big things that most people miss um, is they have sleep disorders. And so if you know, if you find out that this person is having trouble sleeping at night, um, they have like lots of insomnia or maybe they're sleeping excessively, um, but they really have lots of sleep disruptions, waking up in the middle of the night, nightmares, night terrors. That can also be a very strong indicator of borderline personality disorder. They also tend to be very catastrophic in their thinking, uh, meaning that everything is just going to be absolutely awful and nothing's going to work out right. There also seems to be a slight deficiency in reflective thinking, like looking back on something and saying, okay, here's what I could have done better in the past. Um, there is an interpersonal instability, so there's like distortions and fears, sometimes obnoxious behaviors, and a little bit of unrealistic um, actions. And sometimes there's a non-logical and non-linear thinking that winds up going on. So these are just some additional characteristics that you can see fairly early on when you meet someone. I put up this feelings wheel for a reason because I wanted to um, borderline personality disorder, people who have this disorder have have like intense feelings and they feel them at a very strong high level. So they don't just feel the um, feeling start, they feel it to the umpteenth degree. And, and so, but their feelings have a tendency to drive their behavior. So that's something else that you will be able to see very early on, like they're doing things because they feel this sense of rage, therefore they might be lashing out. Or because they're grieving, they might be crying for long periods of time. So if they might feel lonely, for instance, they might behave very busy um, because they don't want to not be alone. If they feel overwhelmed um, by things or they feel like everything is their fault, um, they might actually do some self-harming behaviors and might even attempt suicide. Um, when they feel that um, that they don't know what they want from life um, and they don't even know what they like or don't like. They have a tendency to change jobs or hobbies or goals or even ambitions or studies along the way. When they feel like um, they don't feel like they're a real person at all at times and sometimes they feel like they're a very bad person and that often results in behaviors like avoiding activities or quitting something just before it actually gets achieved. Uh, so that um, they they don't want to disappoint other people along the way. And then last is sometimes they feel like they're a child in an adult world, which often results um, in overspending or binge eating to the point that it can actually be very harmful to them. So those are a couple of examples of just how their feelings might actually drive their behavior. 
I want to take a moment to talk about disassociation because for um, people who have borderline personality disorder, this is the fight, this is the flight, not fight response. And I actually watched a client do this in session one time. She came in um, with her boyfriend and, and just so you know, her boyfriend was like a Harley Davidson, you know, former Marine, um, really very tough guy, okay? Um, he had ridden his motorcycle and in Florida here, like when you're riding a motorcycle and it's 90 degrees, most people don't wear full gear, but he wore his full gear and he was definitely a tough looking dude. And she came in um, with him because she was convinced that he was just doing these awful things. And um, right when we were in the middle of session, something triggered in her. She became fearful. She felt like she was going to be abandoned by him. And she literally stood up and started pointing her finger at him and yelling at him. And um, and he kind of looked at me and I looked at him because we both knew that he could take her down in about two seconds. Before. And so we were a little worried about, I was definitely fearful of what was about to happen, but he kind of gave me the look like, I got this. And, and then she sat down and, um, and so I just gave her a minute and then I asked a simple question. Do you remember what just happened? And she said, what are you talking about? And she actually picked back up with the conversation before she stood up and started pointing her finger and yelling at him. And it was the first time I had actually fully seen a dissociative event happen right in front of me. And there are five different kinds of dissociation. So in her case, she actually had like the amnesia type, which is that she actually lost time for a few minutes. And it just happened literally right in front of me where she had this out of body experience, didn't even know what was going on. There is also a depersonalization, which feels they feel like they're observing their body from the outside. So it's like the outside looking in. There's derealization, which is this feeling of being detached from the external world. There's an identity confusion, which is that they're unsure of who they are and maybe where they are. And then there's an identity alteration. So that's a shift in role changes and behavior. So let's talk real quickly about self-harm because that is um, part of what happens with many people who have borderline personality disorder. And usually when people are diagnosed with that, we openly discuss um, what it means if they were to self-harm. And in our state, we call that Baker acting, which means that I can um, place them in a 72-hour hold um, in one of our mental facilities in town. Um, and I do that for their protection and they understand that and we have that discussion as a regular part of what we do. Um, I actually had a client who came in one time, she was diagnosed borderline and she sat down and she, um, and I said to her what was in her hand because her, her fist was clenched and she opened it up and there were 10 pills in her hand and I said, what are those? And there, she said, they're pain pills and I was, I was just about ready to take them before I walked into your office. So I, of course, confiscated the pills and I said to her, well, you know that this means that I'm going to Baker Act you. And she said, yes, I understand that that's what you're going to do. And we talked about it and, um, and the police had to come and they took her. And she wound up doing really well after that. It was the only time I ever had a Baker Act her um, because she didn't ever really want to go through that experience again. But you just never know um, with people who have borderline personality disorder. There's what we call parasuicidal behavior in which it's not really suicidal behavior, but you don't really know that at the time. Um, and they intend to cause some kind of physical damage to themselves. So like, obviously we have Van Gogh cutting off his ear. That's a perfect example of it, but it could be cutting, bruising, burning, head banging, biting. Um, and basically they're trying to cut the hurt out. Um, to make others feel sorry for them. And it's an attempt for them to try to feel better. Um, and this can be addictive for a period of time. So, um, but then of course we have to talk about the actual suicidal behavior. And so those are people who are intending to end their life. Um, suicides are more common in, in people who um, have borderline personality disorder around their 20s. Uh, and it tends to peak in their 30s, meaning that we don't really see very much after that time period. The overall suicide rate of borderline personality disorder is 10%, so that's fairly high. And in fact, um, borderline um, 
the suicide rate for borderlines is 400 times the suicide rate of the general population. So every single suicide threat or attempt must be taken seriously because there is no full proof way to know whether it's a gesture or whether it's just attention seeking. Um, but we do know this, that one attempt increases the likelihood of later attempts um, and that substance abuse also increases the likelihood of completion. So those are two things to just watch out for and be on guard. Now I want to talk with you about the relational impact. So what is it like to actually meet a borderline on a date? So for instance, what does that look like? So a lot of times they are um, very open um, when they first meet somebody. They tend to be very enticing, sometimes seductive. Um, they open up about past abuse, about their past sexual experience. They're, they seem to be very transparent. They also tend to really trash their ex quite a bit. Um, they also have a history of unstable relationships with family members, and we'll talk about that. Um, they are very quick to fall in love, to have sex, um, but they also have very minimal friends, and um, there's a lot of bad things that seem to be constantly happening to them, yet their stories are just unbelievably compelling, and they really do draw you in. Um, they also have a tendency to want to move the relationship forward at a very quick pace. Uh, they might even have some angry fits in front of you um, and start some horrible yelling fits, yet begging you for stay because they're trying to chase you away, yet they beg you to stay. Uh, they might buy extravagant gifts and they might abuse alcohol or drugs right in front of you the first time. So I want to talk about what it's like to have a spouse who's borderline and um, I'll give you this example. Um, I have a client, he's a male um, who has borderline personality disorder and he is married, he has adult children um, and him and his wife have been married for um, probably, uh, I would say, because it's a second marriage for him. So it's like 25 years. So it's been a long time. And um, he often like travels all around the state doing his business. That's never been a problem. His wife just recently got a job, however, that requires her to do some traveling out of town. And so the very first time that she actually had to go out of town, um, he completely lost it. Um, and he threatened to kill himself. He texted it not only to her while she was out of town, but also to his children. Um, and over the course of one weekend, there was about 400 text messages in just one weekend that he had sent out to everybody. Um, he was just so worried that her going out of town meant that she was going to abandon him and never come back, even though they had a 25-year history together. So that's a pretty good example of what I sometimes see. There's this hypersensitivity that they tend to have towards their spouse's mood. And they'll even sometimes mirror the spouse's mood because they can sense it and feel it all at the same time. Um, and they sometimes even provoke the spouse by being cruel so that the spouse gets really upset at them. They're, they have this massive fear of abandonment, um, but then they're going to beg them to stay um, so that they lash out and say, you're are going to leave me and then they beg them to stay on the back end of that. Um, their remorse is very dramatic so um, they tend to um, be very apologetic and they really do mean it um, but they also punish with guilt sometimes emotional abuse neglect withholding love and attention. Um, they do expect the spouse to be very sensitive to their moods and feelings at all times um, and like I had explained to you earlier with a client that disassociated in my office, they can disassociate with their spouse, which is super frustrating if you're in the middle of an argument and they wind up disassociating and they don't remember what they said or did and then you try to hold them accountable for it. it it's a very, you can see how frustrating and confusing that that is. Um, and they also have a tendency to be very jealous of anyone who might be their competition. Um, I also want to talk about what it's like to um, be a parent as a borderline. And so again, I'm going to talk about a client whose mother is um, borderline personality disorder. Um, and in this case, um, this daughter talked about her childhood a lot with me, and she actually found her mom um, passed out on the floor of the bathroom. Um, she was literally in a pool of blood because the mom had cut herself so badly on her wrist. 
Um, and that didn't just happen once, it happened twice. Um, and my mom also threatened to take pills on several occasions. Uh, and all of this happened when she was a teenager. And even now um, that she is an adult, she still has her mom calling her and making threats like this. And so it is, um, it's very frustrating for my client who's constantly hearing this and having to deal with it all the time. Um, so unfortunately, sometimes people with borderline personality disorder threaten to harm themselves even in front of the child and sometimes even do it. Um, they tend to be very fun parents though, um, but discipline is definitely not consistent. Um, it can be a little chaotic at times. They take on very little responsibility for the parenting and actually usually um, make the other parent take on the lion's share of the responsibility. Um, there's also some inconsistency in their parenting. So just like while they have the idealization where they love you and then they hate you that they might do with the spouse, um, they will have over-involvement as a parent. So they'll be overly involved one minute and then neglectful the next. It goes back and forth with that. There is a reassignment of responsibility. So sometimes the child is expected to act like the adult and even parent their siblings, which was the case with uh, my client who um, became responsible for her younger siblings at a very young age. Sometimes there's vengeful parenting, which means that um, if they feel abandoned, they'll become very passive aggressive. Um, they might be threatened by the child's feelings and opinions. Um, they might even threaten to leave the child if they don't obey um, or don't promise to come back, which was what I experienced. There's a constant demands to be the center of attention and sometimes they throw adult temper tantrums. Um, probably the hardest one for most um, children who are growing up in this environment is that they're expected to meet the emotional needs of their parent. And that is a very difficult place for a child to be. Which brings me to my next point, which is children, how they feel when they have a parent who is borderline. And so for them, they go into one of two categories I have found. Sometimes they tend to be overly responsible, who's my client um, that I was just describing before. She has definitely taken on all of the responsibility of her younger siblings. Even though she's in her early 20s, she's very much parenting um, her younger siblings. Um, or they tend to be overly irresponsible, which would be her the second child in this family. There's a total of um, four kids in this family. And so the second child is overly irresponsible and acts out very similarly to um, her mother because her mother said, oh, this is okay. So then the daughter is now um, like, well, I'm not as bad as mom. So therefore, okay, what I'm doing. Um, so it, it's kind of that kind of thing that's going on. So for the kids, sometimes they're exposed to potentially dangerous situations. Um, there might be an overexposure to self-harming behaviors. There's no boundaries. Um, there's a lot of emotion-based parenting. Um, and, and, some, and sometimes the parents um, act more like the child than the child gets to be. So teachers, um, early warning signs of what a teenage borderline personality disorder is really important because while we technically can't diagnose until somebody is 18 years old, we usually have a good five solid years of history prior to that. So that means starting at age 12 and in my experience and in my practice, I have seen it as young as nine and 10 years old where the early signs started to kick in um, that it looked like they were gonna be um, have borderline personality disorder. We had to wait, of course, until they were 18. Lucky for me, I got to be part of their lives during that, and then they did actually wind up turning out to have the full-blown personality disorder. So um, how we knew that, at, like one of the biggest warning signs um, of this was that um, there was a lot of reckless behavior even at nine and 10 years old. Um, and there are some suicidal thoughts, um, several attempts um, from a variety of different sources. There was a lot of self-harming behavior, such as cutting, um, hitting themselves, um, bur burning, um, pulling hair, different things like that. There were intense bursts of anxiety or depression. There was an inability to control their emotion. Like once they got started, they literally could not stop. There was an inability to maintain personal relationships, so they alienated themselves from a lot of friends. Um, there was also um, eating disorders, um, very common um, in 
case of teenagers who are struggling with this. Uh, so is substance abuse, and it's usually early on. I would say prior to the age of 14, you will see that. You will see also early sexual activity, also usually before the age of 14 as well. Uh, they usually have a tendency to have lots of trauma as a result of this. Um, and then also they put themselves in very high risk situations, um, doing things, doing multiple drugs at one time is very common, um, kind of chasing one drug after another, lying about being ADHD so that they can get medication, um, and then mixing that those drugs with um, uppers or downers, or unfortunately both. So the next group I want to talk about is what it looks like to have an aging person who has borderline personality disorder. And the first time I came across this, it was kind of shocking. Um, she just like the sweetest lady. Like she came in, she was 60 years old. Um, she lived in a place, um, it's known as the Villages here in Florida. And the Villages is a retirement community. You have to be 65 and over in order to live in there or 55 and over. I can't remember. Um, but just as a side note, just so you can get a feel for what the community is like, while it's super large. Um, it also has the highest STD rates in all of Florida, and that sounds kind of crazy, but it's absolutely true, sadly enough. So she came in, and the first time um, we talked, she just, like, loved me to death. I was the best therapist on the face of the earth. The next time um, she comes in, I confronted her about one thing, and it was super small, and um, and she got so angry at me, told me I was the worst therapist ever, and literally threw a temper tantrum at 60 years old in front of my, right in my office, crying. Um, she was laying on my sofa, and she was crying, like, like pounding her fists into the sofa. It was, and kicking her legs. I, I mean, I don't know how else to, she was 60 years old, and she was doing that. Um, but she definitely had borderline personality disorder, and that was just, um, it was sad to see that she hadn't gotten the help that she needed or could um, have gotten all of those years. So um, what we usually see as they get older is that the self-mutilation stops. However, eating disorders and impulse buying are super common as they get older. Um, they also have a tendency to have a lot of money problems, um, no long-term employment or retirement plan. Um, sometimes there's like this idealistic plan, like they want to go to a foreign country to help starving children, but there's no follow-through. Um, and the big one is that they're usually estranged from their family members. Um, their family members have long since left them. That, of course, has reignited that fear of abandonment because it's actually happened to them. Um, which keeps them kind of in this downward spiral. So there's anger outbursts and screaming matches. Um, they still call their abandoned family members when they're in trouble, and they still avoid responsibility. Um, sometimes they exaggerate physical illnesses or can be hypochondriacs. Um, and they do have a tendency to interfere with children's lives, causing some unnecessary drama. Um, and the biggest one is they have this convenient memory where they just tend to forget what's happened in the past. And that can be very frustrating for people who have lived with this before. So now I want to talk for a little bit about what some brief strategies are. And I am going to attempt to play this video. I'm hoping it's going to work. Um, please let me know if it's not working, however, because I want you guys to hear it. It's called I Am Borderline. It looks like the audio is not coming through, but the video is. Oh, it's not? Okay. The video is working, but the audio isn't. Close away. Is that better? Yes. All the voices are better. All right. Let me restart. Wait. Oops. Let me go back. If that's okay. More than okay. 
wait, so I'm going to have to go back to, let me go to, I don't want to go too far from the beginning current slide. Uh, here we go. Okay, let's try it now. People want to know what it's like living with borderline personality disorder. It feels like you aren't at all. Or you're possibly too alive. You're a person that feels the highest of high and the lowest low. You're easily triggered by small things. The way a person looks at their watch while talking to you makes you feel unheard. Someone telling you to think positive or change makes you feel unseen. People telling you that suicide is for cowards makes you feel misunderstood. You find yourself living somewhat normal and even happy one day. Then something triggers you and you quickly abandon everything and anything that you're close to. Relationships are the hardest. You find yourself constantly pushing the people you love the most away. All the voices in your head are screaming, stop, but you can't. And you slowly begin to destroy the relationships you care about the most. At times you find yourself to be a burden, impossible for anyone to ever love. At times you shine so bright and feel loved, but it can easily turn to dark when you're triggered by some small, hurtful comment. Anger pulses through your body and you struggle to control the darkness upon yourself. In order to control the pain, you can inflict harm on your body, telling yourself you deserve it or to prove you're alive. There's a constant thought of not wanting to live that you carry. At times it feels like a warm blanket. Other times you feel trapped in a nightmare. Trusting people is difficult. There can be a fear that they will see the real you, the dark you, that you believe is unlovable. Most of the time, you may struggle to know who you really are. It's difficult to express how you really feel, and you end up appearing like a tornado, destroying relationships and opportunities. You can feel like the world's against you, that things are happening to you. Once the tornado has begun, you are hard to reach. You are a warrior in the dark forest with no compass and unable to tell who the actual enemy is. So, you never feel safe. Once the darkness becomes strong, you begin to implode, destroying yourself and any trace of you. And you have two choices. You can reach out for help, or you may attempt suicide. But as a borderline, you are resilient, and you try again. You suffered so deeply, so much of the time. You push on, searching for hope, love, compassion. I am So I really like that short that short film. It was an award-winning short film on borderline personality disorder. It was published in 2016. And it was um, it's just very well done and helps to explain what it's like. I actually watch this quite frequently. I watch it right before I see some of my clients who have some of the more severe symptoms, just as a reminder for what they go through so that I don't forget that um, moving forward. 
Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about is a little bit about what you saw in the movie is what we call like the emotional reaction cycle. And this is the cycle that I frequently see um, with people who have borderline personality disorder. I'm going to use the example to go through this of a client of mine who is um, actually just telling me today um, that she um, feels abandoned because her son, who's 10 years old, won't hug her. And um, she feels, it sounds very silly, but um, it, for her, she feels it extraordinarily deeply and it triggers all kinds of um, past traumas in her lifetime. And he's just being a normal 10 year old boy. He's not doing anything really wrong, um, but this is triggering for her. So like, if you start at the very top where it says painful event, causes emotional response. So in this case, um, she feels this abandonment because the painful event is that her son doesn't really want to hug her. And so then the more she tries to engage um, and the more she tries to like let him know what's going on, then he, of course, is a 10 year old. So he, he this her, he pushes her away. Um, he'll, he'll do a half hearted hug. So it's not fully engaged. Um, which then moves to the next thing where her fears are even more ignited than ever because now that just reinforced his little half-heartedness, just reinforced what she was afraid of all along was that she was going to be abandoned. So she lashes out and says, well, maybe you'd be better off without me. Or she might say, um, you will regret this when I'm gone. Um, and so then now he, as is super confused, like doesn't understand um, what's happening. And he, now he becomes angry because he doesn't even know how he got here in the first place. Um, and then and then mom, um, seeing the son's anger and feeling even worse, starts the process of either self-harm or disassociation, um, which then leads to yet another painful event. And you can kind of see how this goes around and around in a circle. So one of the things um, I want to talk about is tips for living with um, someone who has borderline personality disorder. And basically, it's the concept of taking a walk in their shoes. And, um, and what's really important is to understand what the disorder is. Now, please don't go Googling this because it's not the best idea. Um, people have some awful things that they say about um, people who have borderline personality disorder. And remember that, like I said before, it, the intensity of the disorder can range anywhere from a 1 to a 10. Um, the next is to, like, really be honest. Like, border, people with borderline personality disorder really can sense the emotions of others very strongly. And so if you wind up denying that you're angry when they can really sense that you're angry, it actually causes even more problems later on. Um, also be very present, be mindful of living in the present moment and not recounting the past. What's really important um, is that um, if you're living with someone who has this, they Everybody is responsible for themselves, meaning that you don't enable or rescue someone who has borderline personality disorder when they do high risk behavior that results in bad consequences, because that doesn't help that and it definitely doesn't help you. And it puts everybody in the state of resentment. Um, when fears do get ignited, instead of discounting them or dismissing them, you can say you can talk directly to the fear and say, um, you're not alone. We love you and we are not going to abandon you. And, and it sounds so simple, but that really does work. Um, you can also um, just stop comparing them to other people. That's really important because when you compare um, somebody who has this disorder with somebody who doesn't, it just makes them feel more isolated. And then, you know, last, really try to see the benefits in it, which we're going to talk about in just a couple more slides. There are seven stages of actual healing um, when you have started the process. And mind you that I don't ever tell somebody that they have this disorder until a, a, quite a period of time has, has transpired and they have formed a sense of trust with me and feel comfortable. And then we're able to proceed with an actual diagnosis. So, but once they are diagnosed with it, there's kind of this state of denial that they go through where they don't even want to believe that they actually have it. And, um, and then next is confusion. So um, that, which usually results in some form of disassociation and causes yet another memory gap, which increases more confusion. Um, the next stage is resistance. So they don't really want to accept the responsibility for the disorder because it means that they have to accept responsibility for other high-risk behavior. 
Um, then there's anger, which happens next. And so when the diagnosis can't be resisted any longer, the go-to emotion is anger, which is usually taken out on a family member who is trying to help. Next tends to be depression. So there's like this deep sadness over and feeling misunderstood and rejected. And um, next we go to acceptance. So this is the best of all the stages because this is when they're really willing to open up, understand the disorder. And then now we start the process of therapy, which is the last stage and really helping them to develop some good solid coping mechanisms for how to handle stress and understanding the impact of this disorder on others and also healing from several traumatic events that they've had in the past. And last, I want to talk about just what I see as the gifting of the personality disorder. And um, so uh, this is one of the paintings of Vincent van Gogh. And I really love this painting because it shows And he looks like he a little does flower. Um, as um, are very high, highly aware of their feelings um, and how they uh, and their emotions at the time. Um, there's also an intense passion that they have. Like we saw that with all the paintings. That, hello. So we saw that with all of the paintings that um, we that um, Vincent van Gogh did. He did over 900 paintings in literally just uh, a very short period of time. They tend to be very exciting and alive. Um, they have a natural excitement for doing whatever their craft is, and it's so intoxicating uh, that they want to contagiously absorb. Others want to contagiously absorb their enthusiasm. They also have the ability to sense the emotions of other people. Um, and so they can sense an emotion and um, and even help other people through that. Uh, they tend to be very strongly empathetic uh, because they have the ability to sense the emotions of others. They also tend to absorb those emotions and they can empathize at a very deep level, which then leads me to the next one, which is a powerful, intimate connection because they do make very powerful, wholehearted and unreserved connections very quickly, um, almost too quickly for some people. And they also have a full desire for community. They really do appreciate and understand the need for others in their life, um, which is just not like every other personality disorder. So now we come to the part where there's, um, well, I'll take some questions and I'll do some answers for you. Um, if you would like a copy of this presentation, please go ahead and email me um, at growwithchristine at gmail.com. I'll be more than happy. Um, just make sure that you mention the borderline email in your um, in your subject line, and then I will know right away that you want a copy of the presentation, and I'll be happy to send that out to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you for that great presentation. We do have uh, uh, a few questions lined up, and of course, people can uh, continue entering them. So I'm sure that we'll have more. The first question that we have is, can skin picking dermatillomania be considered a parasuicidal behavior? It can. It depends on what it's for, like skin picking. Sometimes I've seen that as more OCD than I have parasuicidal. Um, so you kind of have to look at it in as a whole. Like, are there other signs and symptoms of other things? Because I have seen um, some hair pulling as being um, parasuicidal. Um, and that was one of the indicators of that. Uh, it was just a self-harming behavior that they did. So sometimes skin picking can be, and sometimes it can't. It's really important to check for OCD though first and rule that out. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, the next question is it's a little bit long, so I'm going to read it uh, pretty much okay. verbatim to make sure that I get it correct. Um, but um, my 17 year old granddaughter was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder about two years ago. She took an overdose and was hospitalized, then spent 72 hours in a mental health facility. She went to counseling, but still doesn't believe she needs help and refuses to take any type of medication. She dropped out of high school and has been fired from two jobs because of her extreme mood swings. I am at the end of my rope. Would she be eligible to apply for SSI? 
Um, that's an excellent question, and I do actually have some clients who do have SSI um, as a result of being diagnosed with this. Now, um, you, it is best to talk to an attorney about this because there are some very particular standards that you must meet, and so I would really highly recommend looking at an attorney who specializes um, in Social Security disability um, and uh, but that it can be available. I do have clients who have that and use it. Um, and just so that you know, we generally don't give people who have borderline personality disorder uh, medication, with the exception of like an anti-anxiety medication, because medication does not work on them at all. Um, plus, they are generally not very good at taking it on a regular and consistent basis, which most of the meds are a requirement for. So, that's why we usually just try to stick to the anti-anxiety meds and um, leave all of the rest of it out of it. Um, but there's also a frequency to mischaracterize and misdiagnose borderline personality disorder with bipolar disorder. And it's really important that an accurate diagnosis be done. Um, so I, I'm, you're not really supposed to diagnose anybody under the age of 18 with um, borderline personality disorder. So I'm a little surprised that an institute actually did that because we all have the same standard that we have to go by. Um, but nonetheless, um, I would just make sure that um, bipolar has been ruled out before you want to put anything official in writing that's going to be on a government form. Thank you so much. And the next question is, uh, first, they wanted to uh, compliment you on the great video. They, they very much enjoyed it. The Good. question is, but um, and, and actually, it is very apropos, uh, what are the differences between borderline and bipolar? Because uh, this, oh, okay. this individual says that they have been diagnosed with both, but they, they don't understand why. <laughs> Why both? I'm paraphrasing yeah. a lot here, so I hope that. I no, that's it. fine, and it's a it's a very common misdiagnosis, um, and the reason for that is because both of them tend to um, go between the um, manic highs, which is the idealization "I love yous," and then the very depressive lows, which is the "I hate yous." Um, and so there's a cycle that goes along with it. Um, one of the defining characteristics of bipolar over borderline is that there is generally speaking a set time period between manic behaviors. So you can almost set a clock to it or a watch to it and you know exactly when that's going to happen in their cycle. Um, and that is one of the defining characteristics. It, whereas with a borderline, they can oscillate back and forth for several times during a day, and it's not necessarily rapid cycling bipolar. So, um, so that is that is one of the defining characteristics is that they're doing it quite frequently. Also, the other thing is um, you will see that people who have um, bipolar um, disorder, when they are in their manic state and everything is great and they're doing really well. Um, even if something sad happens, they're still in their manic state. It doesn't like drag them out of it really quickly. Whereas when you're dealing with a borderline, if something were to happen and they were all excited and happy, they could very quickly drop down into a very depressive state almost instantaneously. Um, so it's something that you can actually see. Unfortunately, both of them have the suicidal tendencies. Um, both of them also have very um, difficulty with sleep disorders, um, and that is a common problem, although um, what you will see with bipolar is that um, they will have like um, periods of time when they're manic and they don't sleep at all, and then they have periods of time when they're depressed and they sleep too much, whereas with borderline, they tend to not sleep at all all the time. Like it's more of a consistency in that across the board. So sleep can, while they do have this sleep disorder issue, um, it, it's, it manifests itself in a very different way. And I often use sleep is one of my defining characteristics for trying to figure out which one I'm dealing with at any given time. Um, and then the last thing that's um, very clear is that if um, a person has been taking bipolar medication and it does not work, and in fact makes them more suicidal, they are probably borderline and not bipolar. Um, and that often is another way that we can tell that that's happened because the medication actually doesn't work, it actually makes them far worse. Whereas somebody who is truly bipolar, um, the medication does work. Um, and even though they might have to switch meds somewhere along the way, um, it, it can be quite effective and, and can help to stabilize. Um, whereas that's not necessarily true for somebody who has borderline personality disorder. 
Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. The next question that we have is, does somebody with borderline personality understand the difference between right and wrong? And the specific example is if they make up a story in order to file a lawsuit and they continue with that story for financial gain, is that a symptom of their illness or are they just profit? They, they use a different word, um, but I'm going to say profiteering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I get it. Um, so yes and no, which is a horrible answer all at the same time. Um, so yes, they can be aware um, that there is a concept of right and wrong, and they do um, sometimes know what that is. Um, but then no, because um, when they're disassociating or they're in one of um, the dark depressive states, even though they know what's the differences between right and wrong, they have a really hard time with the follow through in those particular moments. Um, and and so when they get dark, that's when it has a tendency to kind of like fall off the rocker and kind of like what we saw in that video, even though she knew that cutting herself was the wrong answer um, when she was really, really depressed. That's that's kind of what she turned to. And so it's the same thing. So they can know the difference um, and lying can be part of it. Um, but remember at the base of every personality disorder is a distorted perception of reality. Like that is a requirement for all personality disorders is that they do not perceive the world the way the majority of the population perceives it. So whether they're borderline, they're paranoid, they're narcissistic, they're um, schizotypal, it doesn't really matter what their personality disorder is. Um, it, their perception of reality is distorted. And so sometimes in that distortion, um, what what is permissible for them is lying and um, and being able to not be honest in order the ends justify the means kind of thing. Um, so we do see that quite frequently um, in personality disorders just in general. Um, that is just not an uncommon because it is part of the defining characteristic. So I hope that answered the question. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one last question. Um, as of now, if anybody else has any more questions, please feel free to enter them as this one will otherwise be the last one. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you realize that you have borderline personality disorder and you realize that you have made a mistake, what is the best way to make amends for it if you don't have the ability to make restitution? Well, you know, I, I would hope that there would always be some way to make it. Um, but sometimes what I have... Um, my clients do that are in that situation is I have them write it out um, and um, we kind of do a little role play where they write out what they want to say um, and what it's going to look like and then we talk about setting up a scenario where they might be able to have a conversation with someone um, whether it's on the phone or it is um, face to face um, but not doing that in a private setting usually doing that in a public setting um, things have a tendency to not escalate as quickly in a public setting as they do in private. Um, and, and just really sticking to the script that's been written out. Um, and, and if a person won't even receive a phone call or won't even uh, allow you to apologize in any way, shape, or form, you could always um, take that and email it or you know do snail mail um, and send it to them. And then really, as soon as you've done that, you've released it. Like you have done your fair share of responsibility in that and trying to seek and ask for forgiveness. And it's really up to them to then um, either receive it or not. And that's their choice along the way, um, what they are and aren't going to do with that. Um, it is sad to me that people don't want to take that extra step, but it does happen um, and a lot of that happens um, mostly because they just don't understand and um, or take the time to want to understand what's actually going on. I do want to say this because I don't think I mentioned it, that of all of the personality disorders, like if you have to pick one, this is the best one to have. And the reason why I say that is because it is the one that ha is the only personality disorder for which we can actually say that a person can get better from having it. Um, all of the other personality disorders, you can't get better from having. Um, it is something that stays with you for the rest of your life. But with borderline personality disorder, we can actually tone down the intensity of it. So even at a 10, through therapy and some really good work, um, they can bring it all the way down to a 1, where it's almost unrecognizable to anybody, and nobody even knows that it exists. 
narcissist. You cannot say that for a narcissist. Um, and you can't say that for somebody who's paranoid. Um, and you can't say that for somebody who's a sociopath. They are what they are, what they are. But you can say that for borderline. So of all of the personality disorders to have, this is this is high on my list because it, it really is the one that you can get better from um, if you really want to. And if you don't, that's fine as well. But for those who want to do better, it is possible. Excellent. And the one more question did pop in, and because of the time, this will be our last question. Uh, sure. All right. It is, what would your best advice be for a husband whose wife has borderline personality disorder? Um, so my best advice is um, to have con to start the dialogue where you create kind of like this safe place where you can discuss it. Um, not in the moment that something is happening um, or there's an escalation, um, but kind of like create this time. OK, so like on Sunday nights at eight o'clock is going to be our time. where We're just going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about how I feel and you're going to talk about how you feel and going to help me understand how I activated some of your fears and I'm going to tell you how when you reacted a certain way it bothered me and and we're going to have just like this little space this private time that's just the two of us where we can discuss it almost um, as lit with as little emotion as possible during that time period and set a limit on it um, like I would go no longer than a half an hour because otherwise and split up the time half and half between the two of you so 15 minutes for each um, the other thing that I would say to do is um, to always talk to the fear, like um, don't talk logic. Um, it is probably the number one mistake that I see males make um, when they're married to a female borderline um, is that they try to talk logic. Well, this doesn't make sense. And so it's like logically work through that. Once those fears are ignited, there is no logic that can happen at that moment. Um, you have to calm down the fear. So going back to saying, um, I see that you're really upset or I see that you're really afraid. Um, I want you to know I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm here for you. I love you. I care about you. And that will take them usually from about a 10 down to about a five, not, not all the way down to a one, but it will tone it down quite a bit. And then once you've got things toned down, then you can start integrating some more logic at that point. But you always have to talk to the emotion first um, before you can introduce any logic because um, because once those fears have started, it, it will not stop until something has happened with that fear. Um, and that's, that's exactly what you don't want to have happen because those fears often lead to either self-harm or dissociative. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Christine. It was a pleasure to spend the last hour with you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. It was great. Wonderful. And on behalf of Psych Central, psychcentral.com, and all of you, we appreciate you attending this monthly webinar series. The video will be available on YouTube in a couple of days and in your email box in the next 48 hours. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you.